Like we've identified five huge needs that we have as we're going to grow and mature in our relationship with God, no matter where we are. These are things that kind of build on top of each other. And so if you have a non-existent relationship with God, we feel like your biggest need is to encounter the living God. Okay? If you have no relationship with God, we don't think you need to multiply. We, don't think, you know, we, we, we think you need to have an encounter. You need to see God as He is. Because, like I said earlier, when you see God as He is, He changes who you are. Everybody throughout Scripture, when they encountered God as He was, they left changed. You think about Moses, you think about Isaiah, you think about, I mean, like, like, when you see God as He is, He changes who you are. And so, we feel like if you have no relationship with God right now, we want to break down whatever paradigm you've got. We want to break down whatever uh, image you think God is like, and we want to show you God as He is. Because when you do, He changes who you are. And so, but the very first like, key milestone in your walk with God is to encounter God. All right? The next milestone, if you will, is nourishment. Because it's not just about being saved. It's not just about, like Art said, going to heaven someday. It's not just about, okay, now God's not mad at me. Whatever you would think that would be like, in fact, Philippians chapter 2 says like, like we should cry out for this nourishment. We should cry out for the pure spiritual milk of the faith that we can grow into the full experience of salvation. When you are nourished by God, when you see God as He is, when you're nourished by Him, and we start with the gospel, right? But when you are nourished by Him, you, you grow. Imagine a child that's not nourished. They don't grow. It stunts their growth. Many of us stop right there and we just come to Christ and like that's it. It was a great experience. It was a great moment, if you will. But we never grow because we never intended to grow and we're not receiving nourishment from God, regular nourishment from God. The way God made us is to desire and to, to need regular nourishment from God, not one-time things, right? It's not a one-time event. It's regular nourishment. You need to learn how to feed yourself in your relationship with God so you can grow into the full experience of salvation well after you learn how to spiritually be nourished and that's through the word of God that's through prayer that's through regular rhythms that are nourishing to your soul it could be through music regular rhythms that are nourishing to your soul the next milestone is if you will is to have a child no the next milestone <laughs> is, to, um, is renewal renewal of the mind not only are you receiving nourishment, now you're starting to learn how to process life through the lens of the gospel. In fact, Scripture says, don't be conformed to the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right? And that's, by the way, what repentance even means. It's changing your mind. Changing the way you process things. It's not just about confessing your sin. Confessing doesn't necessarily in and of itself heal anybody. It's the renewal of the mind that transforms us. And that's what we want to teach people to do. That's the next milestone. We want to teach people how to process life in a healthy way, a holy way, right? We want to teach people how to process life through the lens of the gospel so you can be set free from chains, from bondage, from sin, from bad habits that destroy you, all right? So, so we have encounter God, we have nourishment, and we have renewal. The next stage is empowerment, right? We believe whoever has the Spirit of God in them has gifts of the Spirit for the common good. Now, the goal is not that you'd become like me. The goal is that you would be the way God made you to be. And so we want to help people find the gifts that God gave them. And we want to empower everyone, not just like five people to operate in their gifts. We want everybody operating in their gifts because you were made with these gifts for a purpose, for the common good. So the biggest thing there is to find what your gifts are and to begin operating in your gifts on a regular basis. Everybody, not just a handful of people everybody because as ephesians 4 says as every part does its work it causes the body to grow we all have gifts for the common good and as each part functions the way it's made to function it causes the body to grow and that's what we want we want to grow in our relationship with jesus all right now the last milestone if you will is multiply now now uh we, we when we multiply it's this idea of being like a, a spiritual parent if you will your biggest need, if you are in the role of a spiritual parent, if you will, is to empower others. It's not just about you operating in your gifts. It's about you enabling others to operate in their gifts. And so if you're operating in this stage, your biggest goal should not be, how can I be like, operating just in my gifts? Your goal should be, how can I bring out the gifts of others? How can I help others encounter God? 
How can I help others receive nourishment? How can I equip and empower and multiply to others? And so that's what we want to get to. And so this whole year, we're going to walk through this year of spiritual growth, this intentional spiritual growth, and we're going to highlight all of these stages. And, and, and the reality is, all of these are, I think, going to be helpful for everybody. You don't graduate from, like, you don't, you don't like leave one of them and move on to the next. You just build on it. So you start with encounter. You don't stop needing encounters with God. You just build on You add to your faith. You add to it. You don't take away. You don't just leave it. You regularly encounter God. You're regularly receiving nourishment. And by the way, even if you are a parent or an adult today, if you stop receiving nourishment, what happens to you? You die. No, you don't. <laughs> Burnout. Burnout. Exhaustion. If that, if that characterizes you, it's probably because your biggest need is you need nourishment right now in your faith. And so, so you add nourishment. You continually are renewing in your mind. If you have bondage to sin, you need to continually be renewed in your mind. You're transformed by that. Right? And then if, if you're not operating your gifts, you need to be empowered. And then if you are empowered but you're not multiplying to others, you need to learn how to em empower other people as well. And so they just build on top of each other. You don't graduate from one. You just add to it. And that's how that works. And that's what I hope we can do as we grow in our relationship with God. This is not about what we do for God. This is about what God does inside of us. Amen. This sounds like a very freeing life. Not a burdensome checklist, I have to do this for God to be loved by God. It's more like God wants to renew us. God wants to refresh us. God wants to empower us. God wants us to make an impact. God wants all these things in our lives. That's, that's God's plan for us. Not that he needs us, you know, but it's for us and he loves us. And so each of these are for you, not from you, okay? So with that, we, uh, we are actually in the middle of the nourish portion of this. We, we started with encounter. We started with how to see God as he is, how to, how to know God you know, experientially, not just intellectually, how to experience and encounter God. We talked about that, but now we're starting this nourishing phase, where, where we, and we're, start, we're calling the series Cornerstone, because we want to build on the cornerstone. The cornerstone, and I'm not a construction guy, but the cornerstone is, 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 is what everything else is built off of. When you lay a foundation of something, the cornerstone carries all the weight, and it's what everything else is measured off of. It carries, it's what everything else is, is, is built on top of. Well, we want our cornerstone to be something that can carry our lives. We want our cornerstone to be something that is the foundation that we add to, we build on, that's not going to fall over. It's not going to crumble in 20 years. If your foundation and your cornerstone is not Jesus, I want to, the whole point of this series is to point to how Jesus is your cornerstone, truths about Jesus as your cornerstone. We're starting with the gospel because you can build on that. If your walk with God is built on anything other than the truth of the gospel, that's when you get blown over in life. That's when things happen, and, you know, when, when you're built on sand and not on a rock, right? And so Jesus is our rock. And so we're trying to highlight the good, the good news of Jesus. We're laying the foundation of the good news of Jesus and who he is and what he has done. And that's what this whole Cornerstone series is about. And I hope to share truth with you today that you can build on. And hopefully this is something that for those of you that do believe in Jesus is a good reminder and for those of you that do not believe in Jesus, hopefully this will be a good foundation in your life as well, and hopefully it will be helpful. And so uh, last week we talked about uh, kind of the very beginning that God wants a relationship with us. Foundation number one is that God created mankind to have a relationship with himself. Foundation number one. You know, in the, in the Garden of Eden, when, when, um, when God made the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he put it right in the middle of the garden, giving them the opportunity to do what was wrong because he wanted them to trust him. Every relationship is built on trust, right? And so he, because he wants a relationship with us, he gave us the opportunity to choose what is wrong. Why did a good God let us choose good or evil? Because he wants us to have a relationship with him and every relationship is built on trust. If you have no trust, you have no relationship. If you have no opportunity to do what's wrong, you don't need to trust. Okay? And so we laid that foundation a bit last week, how God wants a relationship with us. Everybody is attracted to something that God says not to partake in. It might be different for each of us, but every single one of us is attracted to something that God says not to partake in. Reason why? God wants us to trust Him. 
because God wants a relationship, and every relationship is built on trust. All right, well, if, uh, Adam, if you know the story of Adam and Eve, and maybe you don't, but you can look in your Bibles in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, well, we know how it goes. They, they didn't trust God, right? They, they partook in, in what God said not to partake in. They sinned, and with sin, there's separation. With sin, there's spiritual death, because when trust is broken, the relationship's broken, and so if trust is broken and relationships broken if sin breaks our relationship with god the question for today is what restores our relationship with god that's the question for today all right so if sin breaks the relationship what restores the relationship and i'll give you a little bit of the answer right now and we're going to dig into it forgiveness and it's the same in our normal lives it's the same in our regular lives right uh, you can be in, in a marital relationship and the most worst thing could possibly happen, right? And that could break a relationship, right? What restores a relationship? Forgiveness, right? That could be with, with a friend. That could be, with, you know, your friend steals something from you. Like, and you can, you, can, you can be split off and you can never partake again because trust is broken. What unites the relationship? Forgiveness, all right? And so uh, we're gonna learn that forgiveness is not an easy thing. We're gonna for, we'll learn that forgiveness is not a cheap thing. It's a very costly thing, Um, but today we're going to dig into how can God forgive us? If sin destroys our relationship with God, how can God restore us through forgiveness? How does that actually work? And so we're going to dig into how forgiveness actually works with God uh, and lay that foundation. So if you have Bibles today, turn with me to Romans chapter 3. It's in the New Testament, and we're going to start there today. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to flip slides here we'll see how that goes oh, I see you. what's that the tech people yes <laughs> yes tech people are good actually our tech our tech guys doing great today good job tech guy man you doing doing a good job over there i think i can't see what they all maybe they don't see me at all online and no, they just don't okay <laughs> yeah okay so romans chapter 3 verse 22 and we're going to dig into how forgiveness actually works Because when you know how forgiveness actually works, there's a whole ton of freedom in your life today from the forgiveness that you have in Christ. And so uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, it says, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So when we place our faith in Christ, first off, when we don't place our trust or faith in God, that's what breaks the relationship. What breaks the relationship? Lack of trust, sin. What unites the relationship? Trust, faith, faith in God, okay? So we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. This is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Verse 23, for everyone has sinned, not trusted God. Everyone's not done what was right. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Or am I I the only one? Question, am I the only one (laughs) that has fallen short of God's glorious standard? Am I the only one that's not perfect? We're all human, as you might have heard the phrase right? No one's perfect. God is perfect. And so all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. So first aspect of forgiveness, first off, first aspect of sin is there's a penalty for sin. There's a consequence for sin. And we all know, as parents, we all know there are consequences to our actions, right? And parents are great at telling kids there's consequences for your actions. Not all parents are good at themselves realizing that there are consequences for their actions. But it's great to tell somebody else, you know? It's great to tell our kids, you know? But, you know, but, but parents are free from that whole deal. Because you know, that's do what I say, not what I do. That's how that... Okay, just me. All right, never mind. Good talk. Um... No, there are consequences for actions. We all know this is, this is cause and effect. When we do something, it, it, it impacts others. It impacts, most importantly, relationships, right? So there's a penalty for our sins, okay? He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Uh, verse 25, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. How does forgiveness work? That's what we're going to talk about today. Like literally, how can God forgive us and still be good and right and holy? Well, there's a big word, and this is a word that you will, I promise you you will never use in a normal sentence. 
at least with me, maybe, maybe you guys do, maybe you guys use words like this in your normal sentences, but here's a word right here, it's called atonement. What Jesus actually accomplished is called atonement for our sins. How does that work? Number one, he paid the penalty for our sins, okay? Um, and what did it say in there? He also sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. What's the deal with sacrifice? What's the deal with this whole sacrifice piece of things? Well, that reminds me of the first time we see sacrifice in the Bible. Do you know the first time we see a sacrifice in the Bible? The Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, they realized they were naked. What did they do? They hid. They were hiding. Okay? God talks to them. What did God do? He covered them with animal skins. It's like, because they were covered by a sacrifice, they no longer had to hide from God. Okay? The sacrifice, the very first sacrifice we see is that, you know, our sin brings shame. Our sin makes us want to hide from God. But because God made a way through a sacrifice... Our sin, our shame is covered, and we can be in the presence of God. We saw that in Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Um, so first off, sacrifices. And, and by the way, being on this side of history, we can realize that sacrifices pointed to Jesus. Ultimately, what was that all about? Putting animal skins over them and stuff like that? Ultimately, that points us to the ultimate sacrifice, which is what Jesus did. But the first thing I want us to know is that this, this whole idea of God covering our sin a sacrifice number one covers your sin covers your shame so if you have a sacrifice for your sins your shame is covered your sins are covered okay hopefully we can have a sacrifice strong enough to forgive all of your sins all of your shame hopefully if you have faith in jesus hopefully god would i won't even get there hopefully god somewhere some way would provide a sacrifice that could forever cover your sin and shame are you smelling what i'm stepping in like okay hopefully god did that or will do that well now we're going to get into that. that's what jesus did this is all the point to jesus so number one the sacrifice is to cover sin and shame with sin when we sin in relationship we naturally want to hide because there's shame with that there's guilt with that you don't have to have shame and guilt when there's a sacrifice to cover your sin and shame. Okay, number one. Number two, going back to the word atonement, there, in English, when, when the English translators try to come up with a word to describe what Jesus did, this is what they came up with, the word atonement. Okay, um, and, and in fact, I looked at the history, I was researching the history on this and all that stuff, uh, and, and when they first made this word, like in the old English, atonement literally made at, meant at one mint. What? Did you know that? Yes. Oh, see this. Well, it's good. I, I, I'm not. I don't. I'm normally not the smartest person in the room, anyway. So, but that's good. You know, it's good. Good. Yeah. Uh, so when they when they invented this word in English, it means at one mint. At one mint. Remaking one what is separated, right? Becoming one. Two things that are separate becoming one. At one mint. That's what the English word means. At one mint. Uniting two things that are separated. Okay? Now, there's an aspect of that in our faith. There's an aspect of what God did through sacrifice. Like, God offered a way, after the Garden of Eden, He instituted sacrifices. In fact, there were like five main sacrifices and offerings that He created in the Old Testament. Now, we don't have time to dig really deep into all five of the, you know, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the, you know, the fellowship offering. We don't have time to dig into all of those today. But all of those, like, point to certain things and all of those would symbolize what jesus would later do in life they all were meant to point us to jesus but what i think is important for us to know is that number one not only do the sacrifices that god instituted offer a uh, covering for sin and shame when people had sin and shame they would offer their sacrifices to god not because god didn't like animals i should probably say that God's not barbaric. God's not sitting there like, I just don't like animals. I need to see blood everywhere. Like, that's not necessarily God's approach to things. In fact, what makes a sacrifice even more significant is how costly a sacrifice would have been. Like, literally, your sin, like the point of a sacrifice, first off, if you're not offended by the fact that God had sacrifices, like, that's a natural response to be very offended that a very innocent animal would die because I have sinned. 
Like, it's this idea that my sin caused death, and so the only thing that can pay for my sin is life, which is the blood of the animal. Like, there's blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Like, it's so, like, offensive that that would happen. And not only that, it's very costly because it would have to be, like, your, your best animal. Not just any animal. Not like the animal that messes with all the other animals. Not the animal that doesn't sleep and wakes you up at night. Not that animal. It was like your best animal without blemish animal that you would offer to God so costly because of your wrongdoing. Maybe you've heard the phrase scapegoat, right? Where two goats come together, one of them gets killed, one of them gets released. That's this image of what happens to us because of our sin. Because of the death that our sin causes the only way to cover that was through the life, which is the shedding of blood. So intense, so offensive, like, so, like, ah, costly. But that's what sin brought about. And so when God instituted sacrifices, this word atonement here, the way to be made atone in your relationship with God, made one with God, it was very, very costly. Okay? So, number one, sin and sacrifices cover our shame, cover our sin. Number two, it's very costly. It unites us with God. It's, it's the way of God releasing us from our sin. The last way that I want to talk about the word atonement, and we'll get into why this matters in just a second, but is uh, in the Old Testament, atonement isn't necessarily at one minute in the Old Testament. If you look at the atonement sacrifices and stuff in the Old Testament, you often see a sprinkling, a washing, a cleansing there's a cleansing aspect of atonement as well. So what did Jesus accomplish when he said he sacrificed his life, shedding his blood? He covered our sin, he united us with God, and he cleanses us, like purifies us, absolutely purifies us. Now in the Old Testament, this is a regular ritual thing. This is like a regular reoccurring thing that happened. Well, when Jesus came, it's a once and for all type thing. So for those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus, your sin is covered, your shame is covered, you're united with God, the wall of separation between you and God is permanently removed, and you are permanently clean. Regardless how you feel, regardless, oh, I don't really feel very clean today, I feel so dirty, I feel so, I need a shower. Ultimately, if, if God, if Jesus' sacrifice is strong enough to be a once and for all thing, which by the way, Hebrews 9 says, right? It was a, it's a once and for all type deal. He sacrificed once for all. For those of you that have placed faith in Jesus, you're, you're clean. You're clean. I don't pray for God to purify me. I don't pray for God to make me clean. I, in fact, am clean in Jesus. Once and for all because of the sacrifice. There's a costly enough sacrifice that can cleanse me. There's a costly enough sacrifice that can cover my shame. There's a costly enough sacrifice that permanently unites me with God. I am not separate from God. Do you understand that? That's you when you have faith in Jesus. So not to get morbid and talk about sacrifices a whole bunch today and shedding of blood and everything, but to get the significance of what Jesus did, if we're going to build a foundation on Jesus, we have to know that we are clean, united with God, and there is no shame and guilt in our lives. You have to know that. Because if you don't, you're going to build a foundation that's going to say, okay, God forgave my past sins. I came to Jesus. Now it's all on me. How I live from here on out, my closeness with God, that's all me. My being clean before God, I better do the right thing or else God's going to be mad. Like my shame I'm not covered anymore. That was a once for all. But no, you guys have to understand, if you're not building on the gospel, you're going to get a, a religious type of relationship with God that says, okay, I can never share my sins with you. I need to still hide my sins from you because there's still shame in my life. No, when you understand the gospel, when you understand how covered you are, you can freely share your sins. Not so that you would be forgiven, so that you can start to be healed so you can start to be renewed in your mind you can bring things to the light but when you feel like you have shame and guilt you are still hiding so so if you are hiding today it's because you don't understand or you're living as if the shame is not covered in your life you don't have to hide anymore this is foundational you don't have to hide your sins from others 
You don't have to hide your sin anymore because your shame, your guilt is covered. Okay? You don't have to feel like, man, God won't listen to my prayers. God does not like me. God does not want to be around me. God's mad at me. You guys have to understand that, though, that at one minute, the, the, the unification between you and God is a once and for all type thing through faith in Jesus. God no longer sees you in light of your sin. God sees you in light of your righteousness in Christ. So, so, you, so God's not sitting there angry at you, ready to crush you, ready to smash you, because through Jesus, that wall of separation has been brought down. Okay? Oh. <laughs> For those of us that feel unclean, for those of us that feel separate from God, for those of us that feel like we need to hide, for those of us that are not healed from our sins, not renewing our minds, it's because, because we have to build on this foundation of the gospel. Anything other than that is, is quicksand. It's sinking sand, right? There's, there's nothing else. There's nothing else you should stand on other than the finished work of Jesus, all right? I just get fired up about this stuff. It's so much freedom. I want everyone to experience the freedom of Christ, the freedom of no shame, the freedom of no hiding, the freedom of no separation, the freedom of no fear that God's going to crush me. All that was put on Jesus at the cross. Okay? There's a false, when you, when you don't have that as the gospel, you, you start getting all these false ideas, right? Here's a false idea, for example. Okay? You heard John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've seen a bumper sticker. Maybe you have a tattoo. Who's really religious and has a tattoo? Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like you, you may have heard this. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Well, if, ultimately, a lot of us live as if God so hated the world that he killed his son. God's so angry at the world, hates the world, hates you, hates you, that he had to kill his son, and now, okay, he was about to crush you, but then his son jumped in, thankfully, but you have this image of God who's so angry at you, and so mad at you, and so wants to crush you. Anti-gospel in light of Jesus. The only way that this is actually good news, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the only way that that could actually be good news as if him and his son are so closely connected, right? Like, I don't have to love the whole world to give someone else to die for you. But God so loved the world that he gave himself, his son. Part of, like, literally the word made flesh, like literally part of himself he gave for the world, that whoever believes in him would not perish. He paid the penalty. He paid the cost. He so loves us that he paid the cost for our sins. So it's about time that we start believing in the finished work of Jesus and stop living as if it's not over, it's not done, and stop living in sin, guilt, shame, condemnation, and fear. It's about time we start having our faith in Jesus. It's no longer about, and I can continue here, um, in verse 27 of Romans 3, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? It's no longer about what we do. Can we boast? Can we brag? Man, I was more like, I was better material for God to work with than other people. That's why he saved me. That's why he died for me. I was like, I was like, he saw me, saw how cool I was going to be. Not a chance. Are you kidding me? It's all the finished work of Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave his son. We can't boast. Uh, continue verse 27. Our acquittal or our not being declared guilty is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. In other words, we are made right with God by having faith in the finished work of Jesus, not in how well we behave. Okay? It's not like, and Galatians talks about this, it's not like we have faith in God to be saved and then the rest of it's on us. Like, then the rest of our walk is now God, okay, God did his work, now the rest is on me, now all the weight is on my shoulders, now I need to do what I need to do, it's all about, like, how good I can be, how much of a front I can put on, how perfect I can look, so you guys never see my flaws. No, it's all Jesus. And so when we can take our faith away from how good we are, our behaviors, how good we feel, how good we think we are, how good we think we are compared to other people, 
or how bad we are compared to other people, when we can take our faith off of our works ourselves and place our faith in the finished work of Jesus, we're saved. Praise God. That's what faith is all about. It's faith in Jesus, not faith in how good we can be. And guess what? That's not license to sin. That's freedom from sin. There's no more condemnation when I have faith in Jesus because I'm now in Christ. I'm free from sin. I'm free from all these rules, these laws. In fact, it says sin loses its power when there is no law. God removed all that from me, and now I'm free to live free from sin. You know, the law never made anybody perfect. The law never made anybody, like, if I give you rules and saying don't steal, that never made anybody not a stealer. But when I'm forgiven, that's the power to go and not steal anymore. When there's no condemnation, that's the power to go and sin no more. Maybe you know the story of that in the scriptures. But here's the thing. I want to end with this. I don't want us to move on. I don't want us to like just like, okay, good, you know, finished work of Jesus. Every single day, let us spur one another on to remember the finished work of Jesus. You know, so maybe you're in like accountability groups with other people and you, you confess your sins to one another, which is good. You, you confess your sins to one another, not to, not to be forgiven, but to be healed. You bring things to the light when you're walking in the light. There is no darkness. You know, you, you, it's part of the healing process, right? May we remind each other how forgiven we are in Christ. May we confess to one another how good we are in Christ. And by the way, the word confess means to agree with. May we agree with God about our sin. Yes, that was sin. And yes, I'm fully forgiven. May we confess that to one another. May we confess and agree and see our sin the way God sees it. See our relationship with God the way God sees it. Right? Not based on us, but based on the finished work of Jesus. And I want everybody to experience that. So if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, if you're still separate from God, because it's still about how good you have been and how good you think you are, I invite you to place your faith in the finished work of of Jesus because in there there's freedom there's no shame there's no guilt there's no fear there's no condemnation that's what I want everybody to live out of I want everybody to experience the freedom in that and if you are a believer in Jesus I want you I want you to confess your sins to each other I want you to remember I want you to remind each other yes that is sin yes that is wrong but yes you are forgiven in Christ may we continually be pointed back to Jesus as a community that's that's what it, that's what it looks like okay so um Thank you, Jesus. Let me just pray. I'm going to thank God for a second for his finished work. Father, I thank you so much that you loved this world so much that you sent your one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. That everlasting life is not a someday thing. That's everlasting life starting right now, today. May we walk in this free life. You came, Jesus, to give us life and abundantly. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for those that have uh, been broken free from shame, broken free from guilt, broken free from feeling separate from you, but all through the finished work of Jesus. We are united with you. We are cleansed. We are forgiven. We are covered by the costly sacrifice that you gave because you so love this world. May we place our faith in you and in nothing else. May our foundation be built only on you, and on nothing else. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.